Well, I tell you guys, guys, welcome back in to yet another video. Guys, I've already told y'all that this week is the week. And what I mean by that is that this week is going to be nothing but Attack on Titan content. There's going to be a plethora of people that are going to be shoving content your way just because of the recent event that occurred on November the 4th with the final release of the final episode of Attack on Titan. For me, I was one of the lucky ones. I was one of the ones who already knew of the ending two years ago when the um, manga had ended. Um, I am definitely one of the ones who did not like the ending. I was not one of the ones who preferred the ending. Uh, I preferred it to go another route and take another route. And even after watching the finale, as far as it being adapted into the anime, I can emphatically say there were key points and key things that were changed in order to, I guess, make the story a little bit more digestible. But overall, it still had the same feel and the same themes as the ending of the manga. With that being said, you kind of already know where this is going for me. I prefer the ending to have been different. I still stand on that. I think that the final episode, much like the manga, had a lot of plot holes, had a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of contradictions in it, and it just did not give me a great send-off to one of the biggest animes of all time and my former favorite anime of all time. As I've said, there's going to be a lot of different reviews that are going to be coming out, a lot of different people that are going to be giving their uh, take on what they thought about the final episode of Attack on Titan. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm here for that. The reason I'm here for that, guys, is because you already know how I like to do things. I like to review stuff. I like to give my two cents, and I like to put my take on their take. So that's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to have a nice full week of content that is going to be centered around me reacting to a lot of the individuals who only seen the anime and their takes on what they thought about the final episode of Attack on Titan. Now, before we get into any of that, you guys already know the deal. Guys, if you enjoy the content that's being produced on this particular channel, guys, you already know what to do. Go ahead and hit that thumbs up button, that like button, as well as subscribe to the channel. Those two things are absolutely free, doesn't cost you a goddamn dime, but those things do help the channel grow, helps us be seen, and I appreciate all those who have done those things. Thank you. Lastly, guys, go ahead and hit that notification bell so you guys are up to date and aware of everything that is posted on this channel. And also go ahead and share the content, guys. Sharing is caring, helps the world go around, guys. You can share this to any individuals that you feel as though may have the same take or just want to know about Attack on Titan and wants to know different people's perspectives. Share, share, share. I promise you, it won't hurt you. So, without further fucking ado, let's do this. We're going to go ahead and dive into this particular video from this particular creator. This creator goes by Flame of Rebirth. Now, it caught my attention because, I'm going to be honest with you, on the thumbnail, they just straight up said, I love the ending of Attack on Titan. That's what they said. So, <laughs> we got to click on this to see what the fuck he talking about or whatever. Because, again, I give everybody, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But, again, I like to base my theories and my uh, takes on facts. So I'm going to see what they're talking about. I'm going to see what it is and what's happening and stuff like that. And we're just going to see what the goings on is in this video. All right, Flame, let's see what you got. I loved Attack on Titan's finale. Wow. Yes, you heard right. I'm not an avid partaker within the Attack on Titan community, so I wasn't aware of the supposed controversial ending of Attack on Titan. I genuinely had no idea. I made sure to look into some of the gripes the Attack on Titan fandom had about Isayama's ending, and I'd like to think that I understand the key points behind their strong emotions. That being said, I am detached from the Attack on Titan wheel enough to have a genuine outside of the fandom opinion on the story. And so in this video, I'd like for you to come with me on a journey into Attack on Titan's final episode. 
Whether you're one who also enjoyed this finale, or whether you're one who hated Isayama's choices, allow me to at the very least share with you why I personally loved this finale. The choice of whether to accept it or reject it will ultimately be left up to you. Okay, so in order to do this right, we gotta know what happens. So here's the general gist of how the episode pans out. The Survey Corps engages Eren, and before they can make any substantial moves, Armin is captured by a beast titan that resembles an Okapi. He's an important part of their plan because he's able to engulf the area in a massive nuclear explosion when he transforms. Understanding that, Eren has Armin captured. The team then realizes that the titan forms of the past have been resurrected, and those are their current opponents. Keek manages to maneuver to Eren's nape and throws explosives over his bones, but before she can detonate it, she's impaled by a Warhammer Titan. Reiner is then taken out by a resurrected colossal titan belonging to Bertholdt, causing a ton I of know chaos he was actually and damaging Reiner and John's Gordian gear in the process. Levi right. is also injured it's in his right. effort to save Connie because going. the team is overwhelmed by the shooting of enemies. Happened, so it's not really the soldiers are then needy, saved by the arrival of Falco's jaw titan, Karen, Gabi, and Annie. Gabi lets them know about the centipede-like creature that connected to Eren, and Levi has them split into two groups. One group will track down the titan that took Armin, and the other will focus on separating Eren's neck from his body. Mikasa is obviously very conflicted, and she's tasked with focusing on Armin instead. Reiner and John work together to make it towards the explosive peak left around Eren's neck. Peak reveals herself not to be dead, and utilizing the card titan's endurance abilities, she ejects herself from her titan form over and over and carves out a path for John to detonate the explosives. As this is happening, Gabi shoots down the Okapi and Mikasa is able to free Armin, who kills the beast titan he emerged from. Once John's explosion takes effect, the centipede-like creature appears, shrieking very loudly and tries to reconnect with Eren. Yep. Rhino wrestles it to the ground and tries to prevent it from making contact, and while that is happening, we learn that while inside the paths, Armin and Zeke had a heartfelt conversation that resulted in select titan holders from the past assisting our heroes in the present in defeating Eren. As Armin stands on the palms of Kassavra's beast and Birchhold's colossal titan, sense either, but he transforms and nukes the entire area. The soldiers then evacuate and reunite with some of their families, thinking this to be over. Eren, however, manages to survive. Eren transforms into a colossal form and battles Armin while Reiner holds off the connector. While the others look on, they realize that the steam they're surrounded by is very similar to the gas that turned the villagers into titans. The sad realization here is that everyone who's not a titan shifter already, or an Ackerman, is about to turn. Connie and John have their final moments together and they, along with everyone else, turns into titans and swarm Reiner. This is the 11th hour, and they have no more cards left to play. None but one. Mikasa is left unable to move due to her persistent headaches, mm -hmm. but after a quiet moment within her psyche, she finds the strength to make the call. She will kill Eren, who is within his titan's mouth. Levi cars out a path for her and she cuts Eren's head know, off, whatever. killing him and ending the rumbling. With his head severed, Mikasa finally has the heartfelt kiss she's always wanted, even as Ymir watches on with a faint smile. In the aftermath, we learn that titan powers are no more. 80% of the world has been wiped out. Mikasa buries Eren under the tree, and time passes. Three years after the fight, the partakers of the Battle of Heaven and Earth, as it comes to be called, are ambassadors headed for peace talks. Parides have seemingly mobilized an army to defend themselves, and Mikasa got married and had a kid. And then, years after that, we see that the world has been plunged into war yet again. The war ravages the land until most participants are dead and vegetation takes over. Years after that, a young child with a dog walks into a tree that is strikingly similar to the tree Ymir walked on, seemingly starting the cycle all over again. And that's it. That is the story of Attack on Titan. Now that the summary is out of the way, it's time to cook. Let me tell you why I love this, and it may not sure. be for the reasons you think. The reason I love this finale so much is because while the ultimate decisions Isayama made may have been controversial, I appreciate the facts that he takes the swing. I've seen different takes from the fallout. Some think it's a thematic failure, they think that Eren regressed, they dislike the messaging, and a lot more. In this video, I'm going to hit on three main points. Eren, Mikasa, and the question about war. Let's start with Eren. In this finale, Eren is a point of great focus, and it makes sense that he is. We witness how much death and destruction is inflicted by his choices, mm -hmm. and we get a lengthy sequence of Armin and Eren conversing. Sure. Now, from a macro story perspective, this conversation has a lot it needs to accomplish. We need to know what Eren's plan is, we need to know why he's doing it, and we need to know what his opinions are on the fallout it could have in the aftermath. 
See, and that's the point right there. So, again, again, I like the way he's got it set up. I liked how this is, you know, kind of like a video diary of the feelings that uh, he's had towards the, you know, the episode. But that's the thing, though, he already said he's already disconnected from the attack on Titan wheel, if you will, like he said. So it's one of those things to where, like, yes, I value your opinion, but what you're kind of alluding to right now, it's things that have already previously been established. You can't say that you needed to know why he was doing what he was doing, because the reality is he's already told you that. He told you that like five fucking times why he was doing the rumbling. He already said that. What do you think? しかし世界はパラディ島の人々を守ることにある。この島のみならず、全ての有名の民が殺され尽くすまで止まらないだ。俺はその望みを拒む。地鳴らしは止まらない。パラディ島の未来を。He wasn't going to go with the 50-year war plan, the 50-year plan that would require Historia and her family to become cannibals and constantly eat each other just so Paradis would be okay. He wasn't finna to go with that. He wasn't willing to sacrifice that. He was willing to do peace talks, but those peace talks failed twice. So why the fuck are they going to even do that? Hanji even admitted that she failed in not giving Aaron any hope or of, about the future. So all of these things culminated to him making the decision of stating that, hey, this has to happen. Everybody around the world desires us dead. I don't want that. I do not like that. I reject that. So what I'm going to do to prevent us from getting killed, we have to be the killers, if you will. So I'm going to flatten the earth. That was his reason behind it. The, no, there's nothing else behind it. That's what I'm saying. You guys, it's like a lot of these people are trying to find... Um, I don't know. It's like they're trying to grasp at straws for these reasons, these, you know, pseudo intellectual reasons why Aaron did what he did. He already told you why he did what he did. And it's very simple. The story was written that way. We got it. There was only two options. It was kill or be killed. Backs against the wall. What do you do? Do you lay down and die or do you fight? Right? That was the whole theme theme of the show. Clearly, it was the theme of the show so much in the beginning that that was what he told Mikasa when the fucking killers of her parents were there and he got caught. Either you give up and die or you fight. What do you do? That was the whole thing. So the fact that it ended the way it did shows me yet again that you guys forgot the theme of Attack on Titan. You guys forgot. And I get that you, I, and it's okay, again, it's okay to a degree, but I'm not going to continue to keep giving that as a cop-out for individuals who only watch the anime. Just up to you guys, if this is such a great anime to you guys, and this is your favorite anime, as a lot of people say, you guys are the ones that need to do the research and at least have the capacity to remember key dialogue and key elements that affect the overall theme of the show. You guys don't. You guys forget it. You guys are like, uh, well, whatever. The theme of Attack on Titan was either you lay down and die or you fight. That's what it was. The whole thing from the, from the point of the show. But for some reason, it got warped into a love story. And it, and it, got, it got transformed into some random love story. That's the problem I have with Attack on Titan. That's the issue I have with it. We already knew what Aaron wanted to do. He already said it like seven goddamn times. So the way this information is given during this conversation is honestly quite unclear, or at least it could be perceived that way. It's not as though we aren't told things. For example, at one point, Aaron says that his goal is to pose enough of a worldwide threat 
and have his friends be the ones to kill him so that they will be seen by the rest of the world as aliens who sided with humanity and saved the world. That wasn't his original goal. That's the that's another issue. That's why it's convoluted and people don't really understand that wasn't his original goal. That was just presented to you guys at the very end. At the very end, that's when he presented that stupid ass thing of saying, oh, well, I'm going to be a goddamn fucking uh, martyr or whatever, or I'm going to be the evil that you guys fight against to be able to make you guys look like the heroes. That was all bullshit. That was some, some garbage that they planted in the end, right? That's what he did. That's what Isayama did. He planted that shit at the end because throughout the entirety of the show, we knew that this man was going to do 100% Rimmel. If that was his plan also, why in the fuck are you sitting up here? Why'd you unleash all of that? You unleashed every goddamn wall. You didn't have to unleash every goddamn wall and, and, and destroy 80%. You know what I'm saying? But again, they wanted to put the little dialogue at the end where I tried it multiple times and this was the only route that it came to. Yeah, whatever. That's bullshit, but... He also implies that he wants to kill 80% of the world and dwindle the overall number to a point that conflict becomes almost mute. And there is even a third possibility, in that Eren just wanted to get back at the rest of the world by leveling everything off the shores of Potides. Now, I don't believe Eren is lying in any of these three scenarios, I just believe that it's important not to view character motivations one-dimensionally, or even in this case, two-dimensionally. Depending on the perspective you come at this from, you'll get a slightly different reason for Eren. That doesn't mean one reason or the other is suddenly not important, it just means that it's very layered. Eren, as a friend of the scouts, wants them to be viewed as the heroes he thinks they are, and is willing to become an enemy they can defeat just so they can get the adulation he believes they deserve. Eren, as a titan wielder and a holder of the fountain titan, believes that if humanity's total number is reduced to a point that the arbitrary differences between them are inconsequential due to their small number, they can begin to understand one another. And then finally, Eren is the Avenger. He simply wants to destroy the outside world for inhibiting his freedom. As you can see, there are at least three different perspectives you could view Eren's character from, and each perspective has a different way of going about their business. I genuinely enjoyed that, truly. So we get answers for what he wants to do and why he wants to do it, I've laid that out above. But now, let's discuss what his opinion on the fallout is. So you enact your plan that ultimately ends with your death. Armin asks it as a blanket statement but gets even more specific and focuses on Mikasa. And what we get here is what is seen by many as one of the lowest points in Eren's character arc. He's been punched by Armin and is sitting on the shore of the ocean. He looks up at Armin with tears in his eyes as he's met with the possibility that Mikasa might find another man to be with, and mm -hmm. he's stricken with grief. Mm -hmm. He does not want Mikasa to find another man. Mm -hmm. He wants her to continue loving him. Mm -hmm. He wants her to remember and still be in love with him even after death. Mm -hmm. The majority of the Attack on Titan community, including Armin, snicker at how pathetic of a statement that is. And look, if that's how you feel, good for you. I for one don't see how this makes anything but a lot of sense. Allow me to explain. Well, you're gonna have to do some motherfucking explaining, dog. Right, let, let, let's see what you got to say, because I, I'm gonna hold my take for later, but I'll see, let's see what you got to say about this. Is this embarrassing? 100%. Is it unsightly for Aaron Yeager of all people to be in a position like this? Absolutely. But is it a character assassination? Not even close. What you have here in this scene is Aaron admitting that, yes, he feels anger and revenge towards the people outside the shores of Eldia. Yes, Aaron wants to kill them all. Yes, Aaron wants to set up his friends to be the heroes who save the world. And yes, Aaron knows that not only is his time limited because of his titan powers, the very act of being an obstacle for his friends to overcome means that he'll die. Yes, yes, yes to all those things. And also yes to the fact that he loves Mikasa and wants to live. I didn't even think that it was that big of a deal. Breaking news, man who was married to a conviction that will lead him to his death also wishes he could live happily with the person he loves. But he also understands that the actions he's taken thus far are unforgivable and that he deserves to die. It's not character assassination. If anything, it's only human. Consider Armin's follow-up question. Why? He asks Aaron why. Aaron says, I don't know, but goes on to say that he felt that he had to. He felt that he wanted to. Yeah. So, again, missing the entire point of it. Again, let me let me lay it out and let me speak as clearly and as concise as possible. The reason it is character assassination 
people get this mentality yet again that they think that people are saying that it's character assassinations on the fact that he wept or the fact that he broke down or the fact that it was pathetic or the fact that it was embarrassing. That is not why we hated it. Let me repeat, we do not hate that scene based on the fact that he cried, it was embarrassing, he wept, none of that. We do not care about that. There are multiple instances, again, as I've said in a previous video, where Aaron breaks down and cries over things and stuff that is beyond his control. We get it. The issue is the context in which he cried. That is the issue. Because again, you being out of the Attack on Titan wheel, name me one time where Aaron showed any type of romance towards Mikasa. One time. You can't. It, you, 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 you can't do it. A lot of the, a lot of people try to use the, oh, well, he asked her, you know, what is he to her? You know what I mean? He asked her that. Or she, he said he's going to wrap the scarf around her as much as she'd like. That's not romantic. None of what he did with Mikasa was romantic. That's why it comes out of nowhere. If the story presented Aaron and Mikasa's relationship in a way that's remotely similar to how Annie and Armin's was or something to that degree where there was flirty things going on and they blushed in front of each other and stuff when they were talking and you can kind of pick up on the subtleties of hey they might be crushing over each other or those feelings may have developed or whatever then sure that breakdown is warranted that breakdown is like okay cool i get it yeah damn that sucks bro you can't even be with the woman you want to be with man that's trash the reason it sucks is, again, the context in which he himself is breaking down for. There was no mention, no actions, no scenes, no nothing that equated him having romantic feelings for Mikasa. So that's why it was out of left field. That's why it was so jarring. That's why it was so randomly out of place. Because of that, what you said and what he just laid out would make sense perfectly for something that was presented to us in that way. Again, if their relationship was presented to us in that way and he was crying over the woman he loved, sure, we could get that. But we can't understand it based on the fact that there has been no evidence throughout the entirety of the story from his side that he showed he was romantically feeling any type of feelings for Mikasa. None of them. So that's the problem. That's the issue. And that's why I said in the beginning, Attack on Titan somehow transformed from a story about freedom and fighting for what you believe in and, and, and trying to escape, you know, the, with your back against the wall. It, 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 it transformed from that story to a goddamn love story. And it didn't make any sense. Because everything remotely related to love all happened in this final fucking episode. And that's why it's so goddamn stupid. This is why people were upset about it. You never sprinkled romance throughout the entirety of the series. If you did that, sure, then we can understand that. But there was nothing there. There was nothing there for that. So to put everything in perspective in the last episode of being like, Ymir was in love with Fritz. Mikasa was in love with, with Aaron. And the only way to end the curse was Ymir had to see Mikasa kill Aaron in order for that to... This is fucking stupid. That's dumb. But nobody sees this. this, this it, 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 was, it was an assassination on the entire series. That's where the problem lies. That's where the issue lies. People are not looking at this and not looking at it correctly because, again, these are a lot of people who what, only watch the anime. So, again, they are oblivious to a lot of dialogue and a lot of texts and a lot of scenes that flush out what it 
was supposed to be or how it was supposed to end. They, they, they forget that. They forget that a lot of things that were said or that was done at the end was already contradicted in previous chapters. They forget that. So, again, going to his point. Yes, I would agree with you that that would not be a character assassination to a character that presented himself or herself in a romantic sense to their partner throughout the story. Sure, yes, him breaking down for a girl that he loved, that he's shown that he loved, that he showed all of these different things or different attributes towards. Sure, we could get behind his breakdown. But we can't get behind his breakdown when there is, was no mention of any type of feelings that he had for Mikasa. There was no romantic anything that was shown that he had for Mikasa. That's why we can't get behind it. This is the mentally deranged part of Eren talking. We see a flashback of Grisha telling Eren as a boy that he is free. And with Eren born into a world that inhibited his freedom, he developed an unhealthy obsession and desire to destroy the world that lay on the other side of the ocean. After finding out how well they lived, and after finding out their opinions on his people, yeah, it's not good, it's psychopathic, but he did what he did because he wanted to. That's Aaron Yeager, the Avenger. My See, and that's another reason, that's another thing that the writing did and fucked up a lot of people's takes on it. Because that's yet again not the character that we knew. Because you're saying now like, oh he developed this unhealthy obsession with freedom. No, it wasn't an unhealthy obsession. They were cattle. The, 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 it, it presented itself in that way. Now, what will be an unhealthy obsession of freedom is him, is if the story was written in a way to where they were free to a degree, but all he longed for is more power. That would be the thing to be like, okay, we need to chill out. Like, hey, we have this piece of land. This piece of land is ours. There's nothing inhibiting us. There's nothing that is, you know, an issue for us, you know, right? That is an unhealthy obsession of being like, well, you know what? If there's nothing inhibiting us, there's no walls, there's no titans. There are people on the outside. They are a little bit more technically or logically advanced than us, but they don't pose a threat right now. They possibly could pose a threat, but currently right now they don't pose a threat. And then all of a sudden he starts developing this, you know what? These folks could be a threat. We need to go ahead and take them out, right? I don't feel safe. I feel like we're being held captive because they're more technologically advanced than us. And then you go over there and you go ahead and just, you take a section, a piece of that land and you go kill a lot of people. You take a piece of that land. And then they're like, okay, cool, fine. Hey, cease fire. We see y'all got the power. Y'all have this section of the land now. Okay, cool, done, right? So the remaining people are like, okay, we give up, right? But then you're like, no, 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 I want more. I want more. That's where it shows an unhealthy obsession about freedom or an unhealthy obsession about power. That's how that should have been written. But the story wasn't written that way. The story was written in a way to show that they themselves were like prisoners. They were behind walls. All this time they were behind walls and oblivious to the outside world. They had no clue what the fuck was going on. All they were was just oblivious people living out their lives in the fear of possibly a Titan invasion coming in and killing everybody. That's what they that's how it was written. So then when they actually were able to go out there and he joined the scouts and doing all this stuff and they figuring all this edge stuff out and the story evolved, you then soon realize that it's more to the story, that these titans are manufactured. These titans are actually my people. These titans are actually fellow Eldians that is actually being sent over here by Marley. So in essence, Marley is the issue. The outside world is the issue because they knew about us. We didn't know about them. So all I see is this ocean and these other people as another goddamn wall now. We broke down the walls. We were able to get past. We were able to wipe out all the titans on the island. But now knowing what I know, I see the ocean and Marley and the people across the ocean as another goddamn wall. Because they knew about us and yet they persecuted us anyway. So that's how that story plays out. 
So no, it is it, it has nothing to do with him be having an obsession of freedom. He really wasn't free. They weren't free to just go over there, shake hands with people and be like, hey man, it's cool, man. Hey man, we're gonna show you this stuff, man. Hey man, gonna try this food, man. I know you guys been over there on that island for so long, but hey, man, we got you, man. Here go some beds made up for you guys. Man, y'all can stay in this hotel for free, man. And y'all do whatever y'all want to. Here's some spending money for y'all. It wasn't like that. Everybody hated them. They went to two conferences where they confirmed they hated the island devils. Two. One was just a regular little United Nations meeting, and the other one was this world world stage where Willie Tiber declared war with multiple world leaders crying and applauding, saying, yeah, we with you. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't understand this concept. That's why I say, like, people forgot. People forget the story. This man did not have an obsession of freedom. The, he added that little phrase in there because he knew that he fucked up in the manga. So in order for him to add that phrase of, oh, hey, Aaron, Armin, you were right. You know, I was a slave to freedom. He had to put that in there because that would double down on the fact that he had another dialogue in there of saying that, oh, I'm an idiot. You know, I'm just a guy who came into too much power. I had no idea what the fuck was going on. I'm sorry. I didn't know. He had those to try to intertwine because that idea of I'm a slave to freedom perfectly coincides with, oh, I'm an idiot because now I'm just focused on freedom. So I'm an idiot. I didn't know what the fuck to do. So I just did some shit. But see, he added that bullshit in there. And that's why that line is still terrible. It still sucks because that is not fucking true. This is what we're talking about, man. You guys have to use critical thinking skills when it comes to your deduction of the story. A lot of people who just watched the anime, that's all y'all did. Y'all just watched it because y'all just wanted to be entertained. As I said in a previous video and I'll reiterate, a lot of you guys only remember the big stuff. You guys only remember the big scenes. You guys remember the Reiner and Berthold reveal. Y'all remember the Irwin speeches. Y'all remember the Kenny versus uh, Levi, the Levi versus the Beast Titan. Y'all remember all of these things, the walls first being breached. Y'all remember those. But you guys don't remember nuanced dialogue that actually propels the story forward. You guys don't remember that stuff. And y'all need to start because I'm going to stop covering for y'all saying that. Y'all need to start remembering. Before you get on and before you make a, a video or review or something like that, you may need to reread or revisit Attack on Titan before you do that to get a full understanding of what the story was. Because a lot of you guys are blinded by it because it's an emotional story that was tied to you guys because y'all watched it and y'all had this long journey on, on, on about Attack on Titan. And I get it. But y'all are answering from an emotional point. Y'all aren't looking at it logically. Y'all aren't taking yourselves out of it and looking at Attack on Titan for what it was and assessing it that way. Y'all are in the middle of it and y'all are looking around at it saying this was great. I'm glad I was here. I'm glad I experienced this. Y'all didn't take yourselves out of it and look at it from afar and say, hmm, this didn't make sense. This should have moved here. This should have done that. That's what it was. And that's what it is. My overall point here is that Aaron's motivations may seem conflicted because Aaron himself is a conflicted character. He's the soul of a young boy who values adventure in nature. He's an immature boy who doesn't know how to work out his feelings of love for his childhood friend. He's a young man who had his life changed forever by the choices of people who hated him and his people. He's an Avenger who was committed to his promises and his convictions. He's a Titan user who's burdened with power and a choice on where the world will head next. All these things I've named are Aaron Yeager, and all these things I've mentioned all have different endpoints, which will all contradict each other. The purpose here is not to view these obvious contradictions to say, oh, what a terrible character. He's contradicting himself here or there. The contradiction is the point. That's what makes it tragic. That's what- The contradiction is not the point, man. That's not how you write, bro. You don't write a character that contradicts himself constantly. You're just accepting that because you want to accept it and you want to make it out to be like the Attack on Titan ending was good. 
That's why. That's to support your narrative. But in any fucking sense of the phrase or any movie or thing or whatever the case may be, you don't want a character that contradicts himself constantly. That That's dumb. That's why it's not good. That's why. That's why it sucks. I'm not going to look at a character and be like, hey man, he contradicted himself in this chapter. Hey, he contradicted himself in this chapter. Oh man, he's just a walking contradiction, man. That's a great character. What the fuck? Hell no. That's dumb. You need to look at the character for what it was and look at how his growth is and all this stuff. You're trying to conflate, oh man, he was just this beat up young boy, this amateur boy who had no idea what the fuck was going on. And, and he was just guy who came into too much power and he didn't know how to come profess his love to anybody and shit like that. What do you mean he didn't know how to profess his love? He clearly knew how to profess his love because he showed his love for his people. He showed his love through action with his fucking comrades. So I'm confused as to how all of a sudden he doesn't know how to individualize that or be like, hmm, you know what? I really do care about you. I really do. I, I really do care about y'all. He can li he can literally do that, but he's confused and, and doesn't know how to how to do it with somebody else. He doesn't know how to say his piece with Mikasa. Huh? Really? Somebody he grew up with? Or maybe is it the fact that actually he saw her as a sisterly type figure? That's why. And then randomly at the end of the fucking book, it's, oh, I don't want her to be with another man. When he had no romantic episodes of any kind towards her. Maybe it was that makes it sad and in my opinion that's what makes Aaron real have you ever not been in a situation like that being put in a specific place in time with a choice to make and the different versions of who you are are all contradicting each other the different perspectives of who you are each wants something different you no. as a man you as a brother you as a student you as a lover there could be instances where all those iterations of who you are contradict each other to a point where it doesn't make sense but that's okay no, that's not okay. That doesn't even make that's no. You're trying to make it pseudo intellectual, but no, that's not true. As a brother, as a brother, and as a a lover, and as a son, or whatever the case may be for me, when whoever I am as a person, those actions will dictate based on the scenario that I'm in. So for you to say that, it's not going to contradict anything. Nothing's going to contradict anything. Because that's just who that's just who you are. So whatever you're trying to say, you might want to try to make it a little bit more plain. You that's nothing that I do as a brother, a, a lover, or a son. It changes. I'm still the same person through and through. Nothing just contradicts it. Those different points of contention of who I am does not change me. I'm still, I still have the same feelings that I have regardless of whatever it is. There's going to be different scenarios. My mom may want something different than what my girlfriend may like or, or want, but that's still not going to change me. Like, I don't understand how that would contradict or how you would even contradict that. If my mom wants a, a, a present and then my girlfriend wants a present just because I'm, she's my mom, I'm not going to get her a present. I'm going to get my girlfriend a present. I'm going to get both of them a fucking present. So, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's what it means to be human sometimes. That is one of the reasons why I loved this finale. That is Aaron Yeager. All right, so you get it. Let's move on to Mikasa. Mikasa's role in the final episode was special, in my opinion. We spend a lot of time setting up the moral dilemma within her. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't want to kill Eren, but she knows she doesn't have a choice. She's burdened and overwhelmed by the headaches, so much so that it inhabits her movement. But after some deep soul searching, she makes the decision to kill Eren, which she does. Mikasa is joined tightly with Ymir, the founder. You see, we learn from Eren that Titans have continued to exist because Ymir continues to obey Kin Fritz's order. In other words, Ymir could have done away with the Titans at any time she wanted, but continued to do so because of Kin Fritz's order. The obvious question here is why. The reason, as we come to learn, 
is that she was in love with King Fritz. Now when I hear that, I'm 100% taken aback by this, but the more I think about it, the more I understand. Not agree, understand. You see, Ymir is a slave, and you have to understand, slavery as a concept in of itself is illogical. The idea that you should own another human being and perceive them to be less of a human than you are is illogical. By that same extension, you shouldn't expect a slave girl's existence to be motivated by logic either. How could she love a man who had her hunted down like a wild animal? How could she love a man who just had her as a concubine? How could she love a man who didn't care as she lay bleeding on the ground, wounded because she took a blow for him? How could she love a man who fed her remains to her own children? How could she continue to do his bidding? Yes, 100 times yes. Yet again, that's the point. That is the tragedy. Breaking news. The slave girl who saw her village burned to pieces and saw herself taken into bondage cannot tell real love from abusive love. Breaking news again. The slave girl who was not viewed as a human being does not understand the value of her life in the king's eyes. I don't know about you, but that sounds oddly realistic to me. That very image is slave mentality, and it's very dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous. She's been conditioned into doing her master's bidding 2,000 years after his death. That is the tragedy. Let me let me explain. Let me let me let me make let me make something evidently clear. Another contradiction with this entire situation here. And it just came to me. And I think it was brilliant, right? This is why that whole Ymir loving Fritz is bullshit. The entire thing, the entire thing of Attack on Titan was freedom. That was the entire thing. You can you can say what you will. You guys can you can boil it down and you can try to add these other little things and stuff like that. But once you peel back the onion and you peel back the layers and you look at what is the core theme of Attack on Titan, the core theme of Attack on Titan was freedom. That's what it was. That was the core theme, right? So when you have a girl. Who you claim? Who you all claim to be? You know, this girl who just was in love with this guy. Apparently, after he did all these atrocities and did all of this stuff, right? My thing is, is that you knew better. You knew right from wrong, and you weren't so confused about love that you did not know what to fucking do. It clearly was about freedom based on chapter 122. Chapter 122 clearly shows that it was based about freedom. This girl literally freed pigs. That within itself shows the yearning and the longing of freeing something when you yourself were not free. You yourself did not see yourself as free. So the fact that you took the time to free pigs shows that you wanted to live vicariously through those pigs through an act of kindness by freeing them. Freedom, right? Has nothing to do with loving King Fritz, right? She then had a slave mentality as you said. She did not probably know what the whole love aspect was and things like that. If you want to even take it there. But if she truly loved this man as much as she said that she did or whatever the agony of love, why did she choose death? Why did she choose death instead of staying there? Like he said, you could for you, you that shit shouldn't kill you. Right? That shit should that shit shouldn't kill you. A Titan has the ability to regenerate. That shit wasn't supposed to kill her. Right? And what did they say even in the other dialogue and previous dialogue of the show? Their regeneration is tied directly to their will to live. So 
clearly by her killing her, by her dying, man, she didn't even have the will to live anymore. She was done. That's why everybody interpreted it as, oh, the reason the paths existed in a, in a time beyond that was that's all that she's ever known was work. Those were his last words to her anyway. Get up and work. So with that having that mentality, here's born the past. And based off of that, she now has a place to where she is doing what? The bidding of the king, the slave mentality of the king. That's what it was. After chapter 122, Ymir should have never been fucking mentioned ever fucking again because Aaron freed her. That was the point. That whole situation at the end, chapter 139, final episode, literally shit on one of the best moments in the show when Aaron actually freed her and took on the burden of having all of that power. He freed her. She literally broke down and was crying as he consoled her because he was the one who connected to her exactly what Zeke said. I have no idea how, but she was the one that connected to her and reached her. Why do you think he reached her? Because he showed her compassion. He showed her love. He showed her what that was. He showed her that. He showed her the same compassion that she showed the pigs. That's the beautiful uh, irony of it. It had nothing to do with, it. oh yeah, I'm in love with King Fritz. That was dumb. That was stupid. As I said, you went from Attack on Titan being at its core fundamental value being about freedom to uh, some random ass soap opera love story that said, oh, well, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew as, as the uh, founding Titan, I had to get to a point for a choice that Mikasa was going to make. I didn't know what the choice was going to be, but I just had to get to that point. Stupid. No, it wasn't. Your purpose in what you were doing was getting to the point of eradicating your enemies and taking out the problem, which was the rest of the world. That was what your value was. That was what your point was. It had nothing to do with getting to a point to where Mikasa can make a choice. That's fucking dumb. It was stupid. Let's go. And so Aaron comes along and tells her, for the first time in over 2,000 years, you can do what you want. You get to choose, not anyone else. You, you're not a god or some plaything. You're just a person. And she entrusts Eren with the power of the Fountain Titan, but we learn that Ymir is siphoning through the paths, searching for something. We don't know what it is, but she keeps on searching. We see her watching the battle from different points, and we come to learn that she is the reason Mikasa is struggling with headaches. Ymir is prying into Mikasa's head searching for something, and Mikasa feels those headaches as a side effect. And so it all comes together at this point. Mikasa loves Eren, but despite her love for Eren, she made the choice to kill him. Ymir watches as Mikasa kills Eren and then kisses him, all while having a faint smile on her face. She now takes on the visage of a much older, beautiful woman because she now has her answer. She has matured, if you will. She can be in love with King Fritz, but it does not mean that she cannot defy his will. If Mikasa loved Eren and killed him, Ymir can love Fritz and seize Titan creation. Now you might hear that and think, well duh, of course, just because you love someone doesn't mean you have to do everything that they want. But yet again, you have to understand and you have to remember, as a slave, the ideas of what are and are not okay are not defined by you. They are defined for you. You don't know what you can and cannot do. Aaron can waltz in and tell you that you actually get to choose. Yay, sure, okay. But what can I choose? Can I really choose anything? Can I make that big of a decision? Which of these decisions are okay and not okay to make? Those are the questions that follow. And she kept searching for that answer right, until she saw Mikasa so actually kill Aaron, enough. giving Ymir the answer she was looking for. My love for King Fritz does not have to bind me from what I know is right. I really hope people can understand this better moving forward. And then as far as Mikasa getting married is concerned, yeah, cool. Um, Aaron was never gonna be alive, so I expected as much. If you can't wrap your head around her loving Aaron, but still finding happiness with him dead, I don't know what to tell you. There was no way Aaron was going to live. He needed but to she die. Didn't find there was happiness. no way Mikasa needed to She didn't find happiness because she was at his grave the whole time and kept visiting his grave. She still was, she was Jada Pinkett. 
Mikasa essentially turned to Jada Pinkett. She was still obsessed over a dead man. Even though she had a whole family, she was still obsessed over a dead man. Good job, Miss Yama. <laughs> to die with Aaron. She had to live. And so, do you want her to stay single forever? I, I certainly don't. So, yeah, it's fine. Let's get to the last point. Okay, so this last point is the thematic undertone of Attack on Titan. I want to specifically talk about Isayama's stance on war. Starting off, understand this. Isayama isn't trying to give you his opinion on how to stop war. Attack on Titan isn't a story where you can look at the events that transpired to say, oh, we need to do XYZ in order to attain world peace. Isayama in reality, if anything, is issuing a statement of warning. Warning and nothing else. He sets up the story with the cycle of hatred and mistrust. The Eldians enslaved the world and created a monster in Marley, who then alienated and demonized the Eldians, creating a monster in Eren Jaeger, who trumps over 80% of the world. Now, Eren is dead. The Eldians killed him and saved humanity. There's only 80% of people left. Isayama has a choice to make. He can either give an answer, he can either leave it open, or he can do what he did, which is to depict the entire world just reverting back to war. Eldia prepares for battle. Battle comes to the island, leveling the city structure that they had built, and a nuclear bomb is dropped, destroying everything. Years pass and vegetation takes over, and a young kid finds themselves trudging along and enters the tree, very similar to the one Ymir went into. In other words, Isayama's warning, not his answer to war, his warning, his purpose here being to warn you of the terror of war and the cycle it goes through, it might be bothersome to some of you that he doesn't just say, do this, do that, or don't do this, and don't do that, and you'll be fine. Yeah, that mm -hmm. might be simple, but it's not realistic. That's not. And Isayama doesn't make himself so arrogant as to assume that he knows how to stop war across the world. Instead, he crafts a story of warning in the hopes that the lessons embedded within it can serve as a map of what not to do. In other words, the ending scene of Attack on Titan that depicts a descent back into war is not an indictment of the story. If anything, it elevates it. I applaud Isayama for having the courage to end with that statement. War is not a joke, and he is not so bold as to assume that he has the answer, because he doesn't. Smarter men than he have tried. And so, let the story of Attack on Titan be a lesson to all of us. Let it be a lesson of the damage that alienation, lies, hatred, and genocide can have on us as a people. Thank you, Hajime Isayama. Thank you for giving us the story of Attack on Titan. And don't let anyone convince you that they know your story better than you did. I for one wish I had made content of Attack on Titan much earlier, but I suppose better late than never. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, comment, and most of all, mm. do subscribe. I'm going to be dipping my toes into other anime shows as we go along, so if you enjoy this, make sure you subscribe, because I got more coming down the pipeline. This is your boy Rebirth. Until the next video, peace out. It's good, isn't it? All right. So, the end part where he was referencing in terms of the whole war thing... I get that for sure. Yeah, we already know that. So anybody who was proclaiming that it should not have ended that way, I I totally disagree. I think it should have ended differently, but I think it still should have shown like the fact that, yo, you know, war is inevitable. And, and you know, and that's cool. But I again stated before the ending that I would have preferred is I would have preferred that Aaron live in his conviction of freedom and striving for freedom, but knowing that within this conviction, there is still consequence. And the consequences would be the burden of losing his friends that he loved because they had the conviction as well that they were willing to stop you from committing the atrocity that you were committing. However, you pushed forward to the point to where you wanted whatever needed to be done in order to save Paradise to be done. And I thought that was more of a beautiful send-off to the character of Aaron showing that, hey, even with all of the convictions that you have and all of that, you know, burning desire that you have, you were still 
not without consequence. Those actions are still not without consequence. And the consequences of those actions is losing the ones that you love. And him living in the regret of that and going back to the island where already there is already a dissidence. And there's already dissension in parody. Because again, as I've said before in previous videos, that's what you guys should have focused on. Because they split parodies in two again that would have continued that same cycle. Because there were people who wanted him to do the rumbling there and there were other people who were affected by the rumbling in parody when he broke the wall so those people have a reason to hate him have a reason to 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 not like his particular actions and those people could then rise up to form their own faction and split parody in two so even with you trying to save parody you doom parody to war that would have been a great send off to that. Even though you were trying to not destroy parody, you now created the catalyst to destroy parody within. Right? Y'all could have expounded more on that. But everybody else should have been gone. You should have went through with your conviction. You should have moved forward as you said that you were going to do and keep pushing forward and fight and fight and fight. You should have kept doing that. That's what you should have kept doing. But you decided not to. You decided you wanted to play the whole Code Geass stuff and do it that way. It is what it is. But I think the ending that I just portrayed would have been such a grander ending and would have made more sense and would have actually still addressed the themes of war as he just presented in his video. So you doing what you did is still not without consequence. That would have been better because, to be honest with you, it was a happy ending. Everybody, everybody survived. Everybody from the alliance survived. The only people that didn't survive from the core alliance that did not survive was Hanji. Hanji didn't survive. I mean, you can say Magath if you want to, but I don't really think he was in there. Like, he wasn't like the main crew. But the main crew of it, they all survived. Nobody, nobody had a bad, bad send off. Nobody. So it's just one of those things where I don't think that should have happened. I think it should have been a bleak ending. And still, with that bleak ending, now you have Aaron filled with regret on the decision he made. Him questioning the fact of pushing, was was did I go too far? Clearly, I did go too far because everybody's gone. Everybody's dead that I cared about. Granted, I saved the island, but was it worth it in the end? That is a question that he should have been asking. Then on top of that, by me doing what I did, I now created the catalyst to split the island in two. Now there's people that are with me and then there's people that are against me. So it's just another thing. That would have been such a grander ending than the one that we got. Way better ending than the one that we got. But, you know, I, I digress with that. But overall, I did enjoy the themes of the video. Uh, Thanks Rebirth, that was pretty good. Um, again, there were certain things I didn't agree with. I didn't agree with certain takes in regards to what he was saying. But overall, it was a great, it was a great video. But that's all I'm saying. Also, though, that again, a lot of anime onlys need to dive a little bit deeper in the Attack on Titan. That's so that's my only recommendation that I would say: dive a little bit deeper into the story. Look at the story, reread the story, rewatch the story, whatever you got to do. And then start understanding the undertone themes of exactly what the story was and, and what was what was the case. Because as I said before, like the whole Ymir thing, Ymir should have been gone after 122. She shouldn't even have been there. It went from, again, a boy striving for freedom and this whole fight for freedom of, of, of being free of these walls and the different things of that nature to a love story. It was it was not good. It was not good. I'm like, look, I, it wasn't good. That That's just me. That's my opinion. Take it for what it is. It wasn't good to me. All right, guys. I'm going to go ahead and call it here. Um, again, shout out to Flame of Rebirth for the video. Great video. Um, but again, um, as I said, I didn't really enjoy the ending. But, you know, it is what it is. At this point, guys, as I said before in the beginning, Guys, if you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and like the video, subscribe to the channel, 
go ahead and share the content as well as hit the notification bell so you guys are in the know of everything that's dropping. Uh, again, as I've said too, this is going to be a heavy week of Attack on Titan content just based on the fact I'm going to be doing a lot of different reactions such as this to a lot of the anime only people saying my piece, reacting to them, seeing if they you know, liked or disliked it and things of that nature or if they were on the same page of me, whatever the case may be. I'm going to be doing a lot of that and I'm probably going to be releasing a video maybe every day. I'm not sure, but I would say you hitting that notification bell and subscribing and liking the channel, that's going to put you above the rest of knowing when I'm going to drop something. You know what I'm saying? Um, also, guys, comment. Like I said, comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know what you guys are are on the same page as a uh, flame of rebirth or if you you know agree with me and you guys think that you know that it wasn't that good of an ending just let me know and i will try and answer everyone as i can can't make any promises though but go ahead and comment anyway so with that being said guys i'm gonna bid you guys adieu and i will see you guys in the next one